pilotage. So pilotage is basically navigating where you can bump into things. So in and out of harbors, along coastal routes. So knowing where and when you can make safe passage in and out of ports. Um, we spoke about tides quite a lot. We spoke about how to get in and out of ports. Now, you might laugh and joke and go, okay, why do I need to know that in Cape Town? If there's a howling southeaster, can you actually come into Cape Town and go, okay, I'll come hurtling up the coast. Can I dock at Royal Cape? It's blowing 35 knots. Well, 40 knots, 50 knots, maybe not. Do I need to then look at an alternative docking spot? Do I need to look at going to the waterfront? That's part of your pilotage thinking. You know, I can dock in the waterfront in 35, 40, 50 knots of wind, but I certainly can't dock at Royal Cape in 50 knots of wind. Not without a lot of hands and quite dangerous. In the same vein, if you're going to Port Elizabeth and it's blowing that northeasterly, you don't want to be docking there in a hurry. Along coastlines, you know, if we're going up to Durban, do we want to be able to be aware of the fact that there is a heavy southwesterly um, current, I mean, a northeasterly current? Do we want to go up with a, with a northeasterly wind or how are we going to do it, etc.? Where can you bump into things? You want to make sure you can get there. And into safe havens. You're on your way to Durban. You've never been into Port Elizabeth before. You've never been into East London. Meisner is one of the ones that's coming up now because of what's going to happen next week, next from the 19th. Um, have you ever been in? Where is the safe havens between here and Meisner? Okay, can I get in on every tide? <coughs> All those questions. So we'll go into safe havens quite heavily, but you need to know what your pilotage is to get in and out of those safe havens. Has anybody been into East London? Yes, I've been into East London. Can I get there? Oh, hang on a second. There is a big swell that runs just outside the harbor. It's actually mentioned in the book, you know? Oh, hang on a second. That's, that's really real. How big is the swell? Oh, it can break up to eight meters. Okay, that can turn over any yacht, you know? Okay, so do a wide berth going into, but unless you've done your safe haven knowledge, you wouldn't know that. Okay, so there's a passage plan, the factors that we take into account. Okay? So we take tide into account. There we go. Is there any sort of tidal stream that I need to know about? Is there any sort of tidal bar that won't get me in? Is my depth going to be good enough? You know, am I going to be washed off? Yeah, take tide into account. Table bay? Not that relevant. Some of the smaller ports around could well be. Traffic density. Going into Hart Bay. You know, do I need to worry about the poachers coming out in the middle of the night with unlit boats? <laughs> yes, of course you do. They come out flying out, you know. Traffic density might be one vessel or it might be what I would have photographed here. Might be huge. Visibility. That's obviously on the day, but you'd need to know, okay, if you're coming into Cape Town Harbor, in poor visibility, the green light on your starboard side as you're going in at the end of the wall is a very bright LED light. You can actually see that through quite a lot of fog. You'd need to know that it's written in the pilotage books, okay? as opposed to the red light on the port side is not, and you can hardly see it in poor visibility. What are the cooling regulations? What channel is Cape Town on? What channel is Durban on? What channel is Saldana on? What are, they, what are their um, call sites? You know, you need to know these. Timing, is it day or night? Are you planning on leaving? at two o'clock in the morning so you can arrive in daylight at the other end. So therefore, what are your lights? All of these things you need to take into account 
for your pilotage plan. Obviously, if you're going abroad, what are the legalities? Have I got all the visas? Now, here's a big tip. People forget, especially crew, they get onto an aeroplane, no problem, they take their passport with them and they've got their visa. Suddenly they get onto a boat and they forget about visas, they've got their passport, but no, we're gonna go to Rio and I'm American. Well, you need a visa. Oh, but why didn't you organize it for me? Well, you've got your passport, organize it yourself. So, you know, the legalities of passport control on boats, people forget it. But it's still exactly the same, however. Okay, another one for pilotage, local emergency numbers and VHF channels. Okay, what channel is the RLNI on? What channel is the Brazilian Navy rescue on? What channel is Australian Navy rescue on? Depending on where you're going. What are the local numbers for the RLNI, the NSRI? All these guys are gonna help. Does your cell phone work in that country? And does, if so, who do I call immediately? You know, in this country, if you phone 10111, they actually don't know what Sea Rescue is. So I have their number available, the RNI, uh, the NSRI. And then of course, the plan itself. Now, what I've got here is a drawing of a passage plan. Okay, so here's your marina. You're following the red lights down. I've written here what they are, flashing red, red, quick red, etc. flashing what they are. Then I'm crossing the channel, then I'm going down on the green side. Gives me all my sector lights, all that sort of thing. So I'm going from that light to that light to that light to that light. Then I cross and I keep going down the other side. So I have as much information on deck as possible on a piece of paper or on a whiteboard so that I don't have to go below and look at a chart. That's probably three cables. So you need to know like this whole thing is 0.9 of a mile. So you need to have all this information pre-prepared before you get on deck. There's a point, if, it's a, if that's not even a mile, you can't be running up and down stairs going, oh, what's that third light flashing? Or what's the fourth light flashing? You want to have it all on deck with you. Very useful information. I mean, I literally take the page out of the almanac and I do a copy like we used to trace things when we were kids. And then I scribble on that. So I've got all my lights and everything available, what the lights, what the boys, everything we spoke about the other day on how to get in and out of a harbor I've never been in. Okay, a plan should be made before exiting an empty any port. Now, obviously, if you're used to a port, we go in our Cape Town Harbour all the time. We're used to it. We know Cape Town Harbour is on Channel 14. We know we've got a call before you lose the, leave the yacht club. All that sort of thing. It might be, well be done through general knowledge, because you're used to the port. If you're not used to the port, for goodness' sake, write a plan. Okay, things go wrong very, very quickly if you don't know a port, very quickly. Okay, so where, how, and when can you make entry and exit? And then common errors, getting the tide wrong. Now, you'd say, okay, in South Africa, not an issue. You ever been to Longabon? Get the tide wrong there, you can sit on the sandbank pretty quickly. Tidal depth can get you wrong, you know. Going into, going into um, Neisner, you get that wrong, it can get very, very bumpy. Okay, incorrect radio procedures. Calling Saldana Bay Port Control Saldana Bay gets them very upset. I've heard them actually turn around and ignore calls, Saldana Bay, Saldana Bay. Call them Saldana Bay Port Control, that is what they call. Um, I heard them on one of the mechanisms, I can't remember, somebody called them when they'd been given a blanket clearance and somebody called them up and the 
port, the port captain actually turned around and said, is this boat part of the, the um, Mykonos fleet? And the guy replied, yes. And he said, well, you should read your instructions because whoever it was, you have been given blanket clearance to enter until 6 a.m. tomorrow morning. Please do not disturb us. You know, they get upset. They've made plans, stick to them. And in the non-speaking, non-English speaking ports, it can take a while to get their attention because they're expecting something in Portuguese and Spanish in whatever language. So make sure you get the name right. And then getting lost. Now this is a picture of Cape Town Harbour. We all know it. And we come down here and we wander down, come down through Downton Dock and then we're into our moorings. If you're a foreigner, how many places are there for you to end up going the wrong way? You think about that. Okay, turn left when you get into Cape Town. No, that's not going to help me. Turn left. No, that's not going to help me. Eventually you get there or you go past it. Make sure you know where your, which lights and or which buoys, which keys, everything. You know when you're driving through. Because I have seen people get lost in the simplest harbors. And ours isn't that simple, actually, to get to Royal Cape. I saw somebody wandering around here once and I said, he said, what are you looking for? I said to him, what are you looking for? And he says, no, he's looking for the waterfront. And if I took him all the way back out through there into the waterfront, he was lost. He hadn't done his pilotage properly. Okay. Nav, obviously the first thing we look at is weather. We've spoken about that. Weather, weather, weather. So if we're doing a passage of any description, we want to look at a short-term forecast and a long-term forecast. Short-term forecast, what's the issues going to be getting in and out? Long-term forecast, what are we going to be expecting across any sort of passage? Okay, so ocean crossings. You really, really need to take into account the an annual effects of what's going on. Are there TSSs? Are there tropical revolving storms? Do there extreme, any sort of extreme conditions? A perfect example of this is our clipper race. We came to an end. We can't even think about restarting at the earliest until February, March next year. Because we have to get over the North Pacific, through Panama, and then up across the Atlantic. If we get that timing wrong, we end up in the North Pacific in the freezing cold, or we end up in the Atlantic in hurricane season. So this is what I mean. You must look at what's happening annually. When's your hurricane season? When are the seasons that you can make it through X, Y, and Z? So you need to look at these things carefully. The other side of it is don't forget that zero wind can be just as much of a problem. If you're planning a trip 25 days across the Atlantic and you put yourself in an area which is now the midsummer high pressure and you haven't planned it properly, your 25 day trip can suddenly take 30, 35 days and you're running out of stuff. No wind can be just as much of a problem. The ITCZ, the equator, can really, really get you in trouble because there can be zero wind there for days and days and days on end. So make sure you know where you're going, weather-wise. Now, the other thing is, of course, remember these are all forecasts. Okay, weather can change. We can't look at it and go, okay, I'm guaranteed this trip. Okay, so be flexible. I've got that many days, I'm expecting the weather to do that. Okay, if it does die on me, I need to be contingency for that. If it doesn't, then I'm gonna get it early. Fine, I've got a little bit of extra. Next thing you wanna know when you're passage planning is, what are your hazards? And you think, oh, in an ocean, there's no hazards. Anybody going into Rio knows full well that there are hundreds of those chaps right in the way, right in the way in front of you. So what are hazards? TSSs, marine traffic, 
anybody gone anywhere near Singapore? Marine traffic. My God, like you cannot believe. It's a motorway out there. It's one of the most difficult places in the world to cross to get into Singapore. Offshore installations is the picture. Okay. There's a quite a famous little case of going into, I think it's a 2017 uh, Cape Tureo, when poor old uh, Griffin bumped into one because they lost their rudder. They literally bumped into an oil rig. Farms. Sea farms these days are growing in number everywhere, especially along the European coast. If you look outside Gibraltar, just inside Gibraltar, all the way along those areas, okay, there's an enormous number of new sea farms. If you go north near North Sea, anywhere near um, uh, north of, of the Netherlands, there are now wind farms, hundreds of them wind farms that you've now got to avoid. So farms are becoming a big thing to avoid at sea. And obviously islands, you know, you don't want to be bumping into things in the middle of the night. We want to look at our tide. Is it going to be beneficial? Is it going to be against us? Is it going to be crossing? A little passage here, there's France, there's the UK. How much of that tide is going to affect you for those six hours crossing? And what are you going to do about it? You know, you're going into Gibraltar, you're going trying to get into the Med. How much tide comes out of the Med? You want to know about it. And it can considerably shorten or lengthen your trip. Considerably you get it wrong. Okay, so before you go, make sure you've done a course this year. This is a five hour tide to go from England to France. Just do a five hour tide. Here's your course to steer, off you go. Little bit of practical navigation, never hurt anything. Doesn't necessarily mean that your weather is gonna agree with five hours, it might be four, it might be six. Do your homework beforehand so you have an idea. If you're doing oceans, you take more into, grain, into account the great circle or the run line. So if you look at these numbers here, if we just go from New York to Madrid, this is an aircraft one, obviously you'd be going somewhere in Lisbon or something. It's 5940 run line. It's a hell of a lot shorter, Great Circle. 577. It's a hell of a lot shorter if you're going that way. So make sure you know your, um, your Great Circle or your run line routes. If you're going north south, your Great Circle tends to be quicker and your run line tends to be, sorry, your run line tends to be quicker and your Great Circle tends to be. Um, slower. So, you know, make sure you do your homework in that respect. Okay? Whether you're using a Mercator projection or a Gnomic projection. Okay? So remember the chart is flat and your world is round. Okay, a couple of quiz questions. Oh, we didn't try running behind the picture. Um, Okay, so why do we do pilotage? To know our tides, our emergency contacts, to know as much as possible about port before entry, or all of them, A, B, and C. So is it specifically one of them, or? That's brilliant, getting lots of Ds. It's to know as much as possible. Next one, grab a pen and paper. What do you think? I should be thinking about when passage planning. Just list some ideas down. And even if I haven't mentioned them, let's bring them up at the end because there is no right or wrong answers with these things. There isn't at all. So while you're writing those things, do you have to follow a passage plan? Yes, always must follow it. Sometimes, 
if possible, not really. So making your list, think about the fact that the weather changes, what have you. What do you think? Do you think I have to always follow it? Or do you think, not really, doesn't really worry, I just need to know the knowledge. So, So if we look at the first one, yeah, pilotage is basically getting to know as much as you possibly can about a port or an entry that you're going to. Now, if I said to somebody going in and out of Cape Town Harbour, where's the North Cardinal Mark of, of Shimmy's, Shimmy's Beach Club? Wonder how many skippers would actually know exactly where that is in Cape Town Harbour. I said to them, what is the swing bridge radio call to get into the waterfront? I wonder how many would actually know that. Okay, so this is the list that I've just put together. You know, as I said, it's not definitive, weather, navigation, pilotage, water, fuel, gas, food, clothing, spares, first aid, emergency aid, bedding, crew, safe havens, you know, and as I say, it's not definitive. Lots of people will add other things to it. You won't find alcohol on any of my offshore lists, but some people take it. One that's not on there, and as a smoker, I'll give you a, a little tip. If you're going to think you're going to need five packets, take 10. Because you come on watch, you open a packet of ciggies, and a wave comes over and destroys that entire packet, you can go through them very, very quickly. There's nothing worse than a grumpy smoker on board because he hasn't got any smokes. Okay. So as I said, this is, this is dependent on your plan. So, if you are written your nice passage plan out, try and stick to it as much as possible, but you have to be adaptable. The weather might change, hurricanes are unpredicted, you've literally got to be able to change your plan. But if you can stick to it as much as possible, do. Because then you know where you're going, you've done your pilotage, you've done all of those things for it. So, vigilant. Quite an important part of getting a boat between A and B. And the amount of times I've seen guys come in, even from a trip from Salvana to Cape Town, starving because they haven't vitulized, vituled properly. Water, paramount, absolutely paramount. Work out what you need per day. Fuel, we'll talk about it now. Food, gas, clothing, spares, etc., etc., etc. We'll go through each one of these individually. So water, are we carrying, or can we make enough water for the passage? So if you've got a nice water maker, do you have spares for it? Do you have spare seals? Do you have spares for it that can keep it running? Do you have spare, not just, you know, the actual filters, but do you have a spare little pipe like that just to keep it running when that blows out? Think about it that way. Then, if not, where can we stop and replenish? Where can we top up our water? Water is paramount offshore. Okay. Now, remember that most yacht tanks are like this. They're not square. They're not easy to actually work out the true capacity. So know exactly what your capacity is. Don't just plug a hose in and fill it up with a hose and hope you've got 200 liters. Literally fill it. There's a 20 liter can, there's two 20 liter cans, there's three 20 liter cans. Fill a 20 liter can, pour it in. Fill a 20 liter can, pour it in. Add them up, then you know exactly, oh, I'm actually carrying 225 liters in this tank. Or, oh, I'm only carrying 180. Know exactly what your tank's capacity is. Fuel, same story with the tank. 
but take into account that fuel 99% of the time is your main source of power. You might have solar panels, you might have anything like that. You get any electrical issues, fuel and running your engine will be your main source of power. And the other thing is, it is the way you do an emergency, a man overboard, anything like that. You need to have an engine that you can fire up and go. And in any ocean, anybody who's recovered a man overboard, that can take sometimes up to two, three hours in a big swell. It's not easy. So you need to have fuel enough to be able to do that sort of thing. So know exactly how many liters per hour your boat uses. It's a very easy calculation. Go out, fill your tank to its brim, motor around at your average speed for two hours, come back in again, fill your tank to the brim, and you have your calculation sorted out. You know exactly how many liters you used with that many hours of motoring. Work it out. Okay. Next question is, do you plan on motoring? On your trip going from here to the Caribbean, how much motoring are you planning on doing through the equator, through the ITCZ? Have I counted for it? How long is my pilotage? You planning on going up, up the coast and then you're going to go into, oh, let's say, Chesapeake Bay. Once you're in Chesapeake Bay, you've actually got almost a 60 mile motoring, which you have to. You know, have I accounted for that? From Victoria to Seattle, same thing. It's a 60 odd mile motor. It's a long way in. Food is a nicely packed bunch of food. Day packs, everyone is needed for the day. Prepare it. Make sure you know You've got day packs. Each day is sorted out with enough food to sort out for everybody. However, definitely do it to the number of the crew, obviously. Have any of your crews got allergies? You need to obviously know that before you start putting piles like this together. Is somebody allergic to milk? You know, you've got to know that sort of question. How many days are planned? And then what is your contingency? What is the storage ability of the boat? And that's specifically in cold storage space. Can I rely on my cold storage to be effective the entire time? And do I have a backup if my fridge goes down and I were to throw all the stuff out of the freezer? So is it just gonna be pasta without mints or am I actually relying on that meal for what comes out of the freezer? Have you got hippies and vegetarians on board? Do they need special dietary needs? Yeah. Then obviously, how much gas have I got? You must always plan to run out. In other words, don't rely on a single cylinder. Gas on board offshore takes a beating. The uh, regulators, the pipes, they move, they take a beating. Gas can drain out of your gas tanks very, very quickly offshore. A very good habit is to turn it off at the cylinder every time you've finished using it. Even if you have a small leak, at least it'll last for a while. But try and have as many cylinders as you can possibly can. Lots of little ones are better than a couple of big ones. Okay? The other thing is remember that Internationally, all these regulators change and these pillar valves change. <clears throat> so you literally, you arrive in Rio or you arrive in Australia and the cylinders you've got from here or from the UK or wherever are useless. You end up buying new ones and changing regulators. And then you get to the next port and you end up throwing those ones away and getting new ones. Um, don't be precious about your cylinders. It's just the way the world works. Clothing, always plan for the worst. Always, always, always. Make sure you've got your worst foul weather gear. But also make sure you've got options. 
Now, you know what your plan is, you know where you're going, make sure you've got options. Now, always, always remember that salt water, once you've got salt water on your kit, unless you've got enough fresh water or a water maker, it won't dry properly. So technical clothes works a lot better. You can get rid of the salt more easily. Spares, major part of the clean. Shit will break. I don't think I've ever crossed an ocean without something breaking. Okay, Keep spares for everything. That's my list of spares. I have rigging spares, sail repair spares, engine generators, water makers, and I said water makers, not just filters, all the bits that keep that water maker running, various lines you've got, halyards, a major sewing, putting your kites back together, all that sort of thing, just sorting out sail damage, lots and lots of blocks, spare blocks, and you can keep going, but have decent spares on board. Okay, the first day, major one to look at when you're traveling, okay? And obviously it depends on the length of the trip. <coughs> if we're just going up to Langebaan, not a major problem. Going across the Atlantic, you want to think about it far more. Okay. Are there any specific crew needs? You know, age of the crew. Has anyone got a heart condition? Is anyone diabetic? Those things you must take into account, even on a short trip. You must also take into account the knowledge of the first aider. There's not a lot of point in taking along a suture kit if nobody on board knows how to suture. Okay, now I'll put this together here. Remember drugs have an expiry date checking the first aid kit. So make sure that drugs have, the drugs that you got in your first aid kit might expire. Check it regularly. But remember that People put personal essential drugs in grab bags, e.g. heart meds. Are you taking various something for your heart? Do you have insulin on board? Okay, make sure those drugs are in the first aid, uh, in the um, grab bag, not the first aid kit. If something happens, you don't want to be running around looking for your heart meds because you're gonna be in a life raft for the next 16 hours, okay? And then lastly, just remember to bring your prescriptions. Remember to bring prescriptions with you. You go into Rio and somebody turns around and says, okay, where's your prescription for these class A drugs? You could get into trouble until eventually your doctor can send it over to you. So just take your prescriptions with you early. Okay. Keeping a first aid log, and I put this in red, simply because then you know what's been taken out of the box. So a good idea is not to let anybody help themselves. Have one or two people on board specifically dedicated to that. Doesn't mean to say people can't help themselves. It means they just need to ask for it so you can record. And then you haven't run out of Band-Aid, you haven't run out of seasickness pills, or you know you are, so you can keep the last of them for emergencies. So you know what you've used, so you can replenish in the next port. Emergency aid, this is not first aid, this is the bits that go with it. Obviously it depends on the length of your trip. I mean, they include stretcher boards, splints, inflatable splints, you know, braces, neck braces, thigh braces. Now a thigh brace isn't a small thing. If you snap a femur, it's a quite a serious piece of kit to put it back together. Unless somebody knows how to use it, there's no point in bringing it. That goes back to the knowledge of a first aider. But, you know, the more stuff you can carry that you know how to use, obviously the better. Bedding. Now, I bring this up for one simple and simple reason only. We've all got sleeping bags and everything. Down never dries. You get a down sleeping bag wet, you are wet for the duration of the trip. So understanding the materials. These are, this photograph is actually my sleeping bag. It's, a, it's called an um, ocean sleeping bag. And it's a Gore-Tex outer with a, with a fleece in a, doesn't matter how wet I get, I can climb into that bunk soaking wet and I climb out of that bag dry. And you can literally pour water all over it and it's dry inside. Designed for marine use. But 
I've seen guys who get onto boats with a lovely, lovely, tiny little down bag that's going to keep them super warm. And the first time it gets wet, they soak the rest of the way across. You cannot, cannot dry down at sea. So down jackets, down sleeping bags, don't ever bring them. Now your personal gear, I'm not going to go through everything it should take. Just a few things that I'm doing, specifically mentioning this medical again. Make sure you've got enough prescriptions for the trip and then double it to make sure it's also in the life raft. Enough to go through at least five days at sea in a life raft. Okay, and then internationally, I'm gonna repeat again, remember your, your scripts. Um, what it can be a good idea is to check what is a class A drug in what country as well. So if you take our little Nurofen in this country, bog standard, go and buy it and pick and pack. In Brazil, it's considered a glass, class A drug. Okay, and then I'm adding sunblock to that because I've seen too many people get sun sunstroke. Literally, make sure you've got enough on board. Then with Vichilin, make sure you've got backup and run over. Okay, so sailing isn't an accurate timing sport. We know that. Oh, we're planning on doing this in 10 hours and it takes us 12. I always add at least 10% to my consumables. At least 10%. Minimum 10%. Food, water, fuel, all that sort of thing. I make sure gas, I make sure I've got at least 10% over what I need. Okay, safe havens. Safe havens. Basically, it's an additional port to stop in case of anything, injury, foul weather, breakages, you know, any sort of emergency, a safe haven is where you need to stop outside of your initial plan. So say we're traveling from here, we're going to travel from the Isle of Wight to Falmouth. I would put three safe haven sort of things in. I would know that if the tide's flowing that way, that one's a better one. I would know if the tide's flowing that way, that one's a better one. Don't go around here if the tide's flowing the wrong way. I would have made sure I know all of those bits and pieces. And I had full pilotage in and out of all those safe havens. Okay. Now, what do we take into account for the safe haven? I'm not talking about pilotage and the things we are talking about earlier. Okay. Is there non-tidal restrictions? Can I get into it at any point of the tide? Can I get it at any point of the day or night? Is there a lock that's only manned during daylight hours? You know, that sort of thing. Make sure you can get in 24 seven. It's pointless going to a safe haven for medical if there is no medical backup. So we all very good to say, oh, there's a lovely spot I can on the Kogulan Islands when I'm doing the Southern Ocean, but there's no medical backup there. So there's no point in stopping. Easy landing facilities. Now, this is one where people don't really take into account. You've got a guy with a broken leg and all you've got is swing moorings like these boats out here. To get a guy with a broken leg or a major injury onto some sort of ferry across and then onto the quayside is not easy. If you can stop somewhere where you can just take him straight onto a quayside, there we go, he's going straight up and he's in an ambulance it's a much, much better idea. Much better idea. So try and look for a place with easy landing facilities. Okay, log. I think we all know about log books. Okay. The ship's log or a log book is a record of the important events that happen at sea. Okay, that's the operation of your vessel and the nav of your vessel, navigation of your vessel. Okay. This record can be referred to by any governing authority as to the vessel's passage, and it is considered a legal document. In other words, this is your defense if something happens. This is what they're gonna look at in an inquiry, okay? It's a legal document, and it should be written in black ink in neat, legible handwriting. Now, I know that's a bit tall order sometimes when you're bouncing around and the sea's terrible and what have you. It's not easy to write neatly. Um, there's another little thing about logbooks which I should have actually put in here. At the end of each log line, 
there should be something that says initials. Who filled that login? That doesn't mean you do a signature. You actually write your initials so that the skipper captain will then know who has made an incorrect entry, whose handwriting he can't read, that sort of thing. But it also means that if something happens during that time, he knows who to reference and or teach. Okay, a little bit of your input this time. What would you like look for in a safe haven? Let's have a couple of ideas. And you don't have to bring pilotage into it. We've spoken about pilotage quite heavily already. <laughs> Somebody who's got to write in there a decent pub. Okay, next question. Why is our logbook filled in in black ink? Or in ink as a whole, but preferably black ink. And then the last question, how much extra fuel would you plan on taking on a passage? Would you go for full tanks? Minimum of 10% extra? Enough for your trip or as much as the boat can hold? Okay, so three things I've just put up there is easy access, good medical support, and easy mooring facilities. Okay, easy access. Can I get in in all sorts of weather? Yep. Does it got good medical support? Yep. You know, is it easy mooring facilities? I'm now short crewed. One of my crews lying down below. I've just added those to our list that we were talking about earlier. Okay ink because it can't be adjusted for no other reason your logbook should not be adjusted if you make an error writing in your logbook put a line through it so you can read what was underneath it put your initials next to it and rewrite tipics all that sort of thing should never be used in a logbook it should just be rewritten with a line through it so if you make an error don't worry about it just put a line through keep going People make errors, they're aware of that. And then fuel for a passage. You need a minimum of 10% extra. Now you could have full tanks or as much as the boat will hold. Well, what happens if the boat doesn't hold as much as you need? So you've got a 200 liter fuel tank on board, but you actually need 320 liters for your trip plus another 32 liters your 10 percent extra well you're going to be carrying jerry's aren't you that's more than the boat can hold you're going to have to carry more so minimum 10 percent extra and i can promise you there's nothing worse than running out of fuel especially if you're crossing the equator it's a long trip then so finishing up and i'm weary of the time we're running a bit on today that is just scratching the surface, guys. There is so much more to passage planning, as I said, the actual planning itself. Um, the actual plans can only therefore be made, your actual passage plan, because of weather. It can only be made a couple of days before your passage. You can't get a short-term forecast or a long-term forecast more than a couple of days before your passage. So it's an ongoing thing. You can make all your lists and everything, but your actual weather and your passage plan, that's when your forecasts come out. Okay? Anybody writing exams? It will be in your exams. You will have to do a passage plan. Okay? Now, a lot of it is common sense, but it's a really, really good idea to make lists. You don't want to forget something. 
tick it off piece by piece. That's what I do. In fact, if you look at the picture, there's my passage plan notebook. If you look at my screen, I keep that in my pocket and I tick off everything as I go. Okay. And keeping, keeping up with a log can save your ticket. If something happens and you haven't filled in the log book for hours and hours, so you're sailing along perfectly and the wind builds and the wind builds, but you haven't kept up your log book and you've put a reef in perfectly and you've reduced head cell size and you've done all the right things. And then there's an accident, but your log book says, still says you're sailing with full main and number one, whereas in reality you were sailing with three reefs and a storm jib, but there's nothing on paper that says you reduce sail. So the authorities are going to immediately look at what's on paper and go, but why were you sailing with a full main and a number one jib in 50 knots of wind? No wonder somebody got injured. So keeping up with your log is a really, really good idea when you're sailing. Okay, so next week, we'll talk about restricted visibility. And then we'll just talk about the marine environment as a whole. So a little bit of suggested reading. Rule 19, coal rigs. A little bit of stuff on Marpol. So for those who don't know, Marpol are the organization that control pollution at sea. Cool. So I know I run on a little bit, guys. It's almost 7 o'clock. How are we doing? Any questions on any of that lot? Any, oh, well, actually, in the other side of it is in this case, any things that people think I've missed, anything that people want to add to it, because passage planning is a very open topic. It's There's no right or wrong answer in this one. Or any questions about things that I've said. I did see a couple of the members um, decided to fill their boats with fuel rather than take into account there isn't enough when the answers came through. Yeah, Walter, you've actually asked the question there, do you mean black ballpoint ink? Um, as long as it's any sort of ink, that it's not going to rub off when it gets wet. Um, it's a good question. You know, a really nice cokey pen sort of thing, uh, permanent marker, all those things are acceptable as long as they're fine enough to be neatly read. Ballpoint ink doesn't come off when it's wet. That's a good option. Um, don't know if you've ever try to fill a logbook in while you're wearing your foul weather gear and your arms and sleeves are completely soaking wet, the logbook can get wet very quickly. So black ballpoint works really well. Also a permanent fine tip works quite well as well. Um, there's one here. Your thoughts on the passage plan, leave SA to port. Not sure what that means. Ah, Francis, very good question. Are passage plans submitted to the authorities like flight plans? Not in Cape Town. In Port Elizabeth, Durban and Richards Bay, yes. You have to submit a passage plan. The clipper boat that ran aground in Cape Town? Well, honestly, I don't know what happened on board. I wasn't there. In my opinion, you know, turn left at Cape Town after the second lighthouse is probably a really good idea. Turning left after the first one, well, that's slunk up and you're going to hit land. Maybe the second one would be a better idea. That's Cape Point. No, I do know what happened, but never mind. That's another story. 
Ah, he means don't turn left to Slunkorp, yeah? Okay, following that. I haven't read their passage plan, but I, I kind of know what happened on board. Um, there was a change of skipper, a very poor crew, and they put a spinnaker up to try and be competitive. They got themselves caught in the kelp. And it was just enough swell to lift them deeper and deeper in. So when they finally tried to motor out, the kelp got wrapped around the shaft and a prop, and that was the end of that. They were on the beach. So not one question this evening. Am I going to be the only one speaking the whole night? Come on, guys. Somebody else say something. So now I've just got a bunch of black screen. I can see Hans and Francis, and that's it. Everybody else has turned their cameras off and run away. Thank you, gentlemen. At least I can see two of you. Yeah, Hayfilly's back. I noticed Hayfilly got his fuel wrong. I meant putting the uh, uh, jerry cans on the side as well, filling the boat. Yeah, you got to think about it, eh? Yeah, Wavy, and it's probably the most informative session. It's brilliant. Thank you. Oh, it's a pleasure, guys. I mean, for people who actually own boats and who are doing passages, that's probably very useful. But for, for the crew, at least they understand why the skipper's running around like a mad thing before he leaves on a passage, trying to tick boxes. You know, when he sends you off to go and get extra gas cylinders, you now know why. Damn it. Hang on, Anthony, when logging your passage plan from PE, etc., is there a minimum duration of the voyage planned? Anthony, um, there is no minimum duration of the voyage when you're leaving PE or Durban or Richards Bay. If you're doing a passage from Richards Bay to Durban 60 miles, um, Richards Bay Port Authority actually require you to have passage plans made off, signed off, by the Harbour Authority, by SAP, etc. So um, your best bet when you're leaving either Durban or any of these three ports, uh, I've noticed that um, East London doesn't particularly need it. But if you're leaving one of the three bigger ports, I would speak to the Yacht Club and double check what is required. Because um, I've heard of boats being chased back. So Double check what you, I mean, when we left Richards Bay last time, just to go from Richards Bay to Durban, I had to do a full passage plan submission and prove that everybody on board's passports were cleared, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I had to get stamps from SAP, from customs, from a whole bunch of others, even though we hadn't gone abroad. So just double check with the clubs before you leave them exactly what the requirements are, especially as a visiting vessel. And I know Durban is very nasty about it. John, you were talking about here, yeah, like while in SA, uh, you know, Caribbean and Brazil not replying on the radio. Um, I must admit, I've never not been replied in the Caribbean Brazil, I've waited for a reply. Uh, Caribbean, I've waited for a reply, but there's one always come. I've always called them back a couple of minutes later, a couple of minutes later, and always got a reply. I think in that case, there's a bit of patience. Um, the Brazilians often, when you call them and they haven't got somebody who can speak English on their channel, 
and especially the yacht club, they have a very, very good um, ability to come back to you, um, but they get somebody who can come back to you in English. I know for things like the Cape to Rio, they put English radio operators in, but after that, um, if you come in just on your own, I've called them a couple of times beforehand and it took about an hour and then somebody came back to me in English. So I think that's just a case of patience. So those who are going to Nisner next week, you've got a list you can work from now. Um, okay, guys, just one last thing, and you can spread the word. I've had a number of people come back to me about doing celestial sessions. Um, so I'm going to get hold of Kerry and we'll just send out a, a questionnaire because I've had a couple of guys saying they want to do tickets and I've had a couple of guys saying they just want celestial sessions. Um, Al, you and I spoke about this a couple of days ago. So I think we need to get some feedback generally um, to be able to take this, these sessions maybe a little bit further. And I'm quite happy, you know, the lockdown closing and that sort of thing. We can spend some evenings at the club putting together celestial sessions and or tickets for those who are interested and and see if we can't take it further so guys can it's not just an, uh, an information session but we can actually take it further and say okay the royal cape are going to put this on no affiliations to any school no twisting you know the rules but we do it as royal cape you know and uh, uh so let's i think we'll get kiri to send out a an ideas question to say how many people are interested and are we interested in doing a couple of evenings to do a celestial session even if it's not a full course perhaps there is interest that i can come and give a couple of two-hour lectures in the evening or something because celestial seems to be the question i've had most Well, it's a very good idea. Only <laughs> I hope you restart it when the bloody COVID will go away. Sorry, hang on, Greg. Uh, my volume at this end is a little low. Let me just, before you keep going. Well, it's a great idea, I said. Only I hope that you will do it after the bloody COVID will go away from South Africa and from Poland. <laughs> <laughs> because otherwise I cannot come. <laughs> well, Greg, you might be in a similar position to me because I've still got a boat sitting in the Philippines that I've got to go the rest of the way around the world with. That's it. <laughs> you know, that's, at least my is in safe place. <laughs> and it's very looked after. Look, Alan Hathaway is... <laughs> uh, my boat's sitting in the Philippines. Watching this. Being that's a terrible, you know. I know what is the situation in the Philippines, you know. It's, is as bad as in United States or whatever, but well, the Philippines is now one of the worst in the world. Worst, mm. yeah, we're not allowed anywhere near it. We were going to have a system where the various skippers came out and looked after the 11 boats. So I did a month, and then the next yeah. guy did a month, and the next guy sort of thing. And uh, the poor guy who started it is still there, he's not allowed to leave him, we're not allowed to go and relieve him. What about electricity supply and stuff like this? You can have all your batteries flat and damaged. No, the boats are being looked after. They get the engines and the generators get run every day. Uh -huh. The boats are being pulled out and masked out. All the sails are below deck. So the boats are being looked after. But, you know, we're going to get back to some very dirty, unwashed, unkept boats because there's only one person there looking after 11 race boats. It's not an easy job. Mm. Yeah, it's not fair. Wavy Gregory's boat is parked right next to mine. That's the one on the left there. Day off. Day off. Oh, okay. 
<laughs> Ben's the one with all the fenders because of you. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a steel boat, man. Yes, fortunately, it's a steel stuff, so <laughs> it will last only in ten years, and hope <laughs> they have a vaccine earlier. <laughs> Uh, anyway, anyway, it was very nice, bottom, well, well done. Bottom is 10 millimeters, so you know, it takes a lot of time <laughs> for the rust to go through. <laughs> okay, guys, I think if Kerry wants to, Kerry will probably want to, if she's around, that's it. I am, and I would. Oh, Kerry, if you, if there's no more questions, Kerry would probably like to end the session and get on with her life. Yeah, I'm dedicated Thank to all of us. I need a, I need an evening. Larry, thanks a lot for, for hanging around again. This it's evening. a lot. It's the last, last session next week. I promise you can have your Wednesday nights back again. Yeah, and then I'm going to Nasna, so I'm, I'm very excited. Yeah. Oh. I'm going to the cruises. I've got to learn how the cruises operate. <laughs> I'd be careful of that. I've been, I'll spend some time with them. I'd run. Run no, for your life. Hayley's giggling already. Life. You can see it. Hayley's already, he's in love with this idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We nervous. Sailing the office is nervous, but it's good. We'll be fun. It'll be good fun. <laughs> <laughs> Real sailors who don't know what they're doing. <laughs> uh, be careful. Haveley's geolock still on, so he's not coming. He's only coming up. Oh. Spectator. At least you got someone. But then again, Saunders is going, so you've got to really be worried now. With Butt. Even more With Butt? Even yeah. worse. My God. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be good. Okay, be good fun. Thanks so much. Pleasure. Have a lovely evening, everybody. See you all next week. Cheers, guys. See you. Bye.